Welcome to Best of Reddit. Be sure to subscribe as we upload new content daily. Today's first Reddit revenge story is titled, Ruin My Fishing Fun. Guess I'll have to try and catch something else. Back when I was in high school, must have been about 14 years old, every Wednesday afternoon we got to choose a sport and we would all be bussed out to various locations to go have fun. There was plenty of shitty options and a few that were very sought after, with the most popular choice being, fishing, because we would mostly go to a wharf that also had a fish and chip shop that the teacher let us use. Most people would pick this sport to sit on the wharf and eat junk food and not actually fish at all, and with there being a pecking order in place on who gets first choice for choosing their sport selection, it took me years before I even got the opportunity to go fishing at school. I was a pretty keen fisherman at the time, spending a lot of my free time at rivers and beaches blissfully throwing a line in the water. I was over the moon and brought some of my more expensive gear and my flashy new rod and a cheap hand reel to use for spare lime. The teacher who took us out that day was an absolute pushover, and couldn't care less about what was going on with us students. About five minutes after putting my line in the water, some kids my age showed up from a rival school, they were skipping class, and started annoying us. Teasing us, stealing food from some of the other students, and a barrage of other teenage antics. Me, being scared of confrontation and built like a wet sponge, went to go and get the teacher to ask for some help getting the other kids to leave and let us enjoy ourselves. He huffed and puffed but eventually came over to where they were harassing us and in a half-serious sentence said, stop annoying Nitrous, he wants to catch a fish. This fueled the fire unsurprisingly, and they ramped up the game tenfold. They got in my face and started mocking me, then one of them had a bright idea, and they kicked my hand reel into the water. Before I could do anything they scampered away and hid under the wharf. I shed a tear but didn't have the guts to say anything to them. I walked over to let the teacher know what had happened, and he unsurprisingly said, well you need to be more careful with your belongings, and that was that. Being a hot summer day, those annoying kids began to swim underneath the dock, it was a rocky, oystery mess under there but whatever, and were giggling like mad, but I tried my best to ignore them. I wanted to catch a fish. One of the other kids who was fishing a few meters away from me called out and said, oh man, I had a fish but it got away, and it snapped the whole line. That sucks, but doesn't affect me, I'm a professional. I had expensive braided line that was quite hard to break. A few minutes later a kid on the other side had the same thing happen to them. And then seconds after that, I felt a big tug and boom, my line snapped. I thought to myself, huh, that's weird because there's only small fish in here, nothing big enough to break a line. That's when I saw one of the kids from earlier peek out from underneath the wharf with a small pair of scissors, and it all made sense. I went and tried to sob to the teacher, who in no uncertain terms told me to stop bothering him, and asked the kids myself to leave me alone. Yeah, I'm sure that will work. They had been cutting our lines, and I knew I had to do something about it. I got into my tackle box and found my strongest line, a meter long stainless steel leader line, almost impossible to break, cut, snap, and a nice fat hook. I took off a few meters of line, attached that to the steel leader, and then tightly secured the hook to the end. I finished off my crude invention and tied that off to the line of my rod. I felt like MacGyver. The plan was in motion, there was no turning back now. I played dumb, and poked my head underneath the dock to tell him to please leave our lines alone, hoping they'd give enough courage to go through with it, and before I could even say anything, I got splashed by a big barrage of water from them. I yelled out from the top of the wharf, please guys. I really want to catch a fish. With a bit of razzle-dazzle so it appeared I was still attempting to catch something, I put a very mushy prawn on the line that would fall of if you looked at it the wrong way, and dropped my line into the water. It took only 30 seconds before I felt that faithful tug, and knowing they wouldn't be able to cut that line, with a swift motion, I tugged back. Hard. As is standard when fishing, take it from me. I heard someone let out a big scream, and with a quick motion got the line nice and tangled around a nail sticking out of the wharf under the guise of trying to do something to help. Within seconds the pushover teacher finally came over, guess he changed his tune now that it sounded like someone was getting murdered under his guard, and we both looked over the edge to see a kid with a nice juicy hook embedded in his hand screaming like a banshee. I used my pudgy appearance and, couldn't hurt a fly, demeanor to my advantage, and looked at the teacher to say, I'm not sure what happened, I was just trying to catch a fish. 
It took him a solid minute to get the line disconnected and set the kid loose, in which I was able to pack up my gear and get ready to leave, and the commotion of 30 students coming to see what on earth was going on was spectacular, no one seemed to have any suspicion that this could have been a purposeful act of vengeance. From what I heard the man-sized fish I caught had to go to the hospital to get the hook removed, and became known as Fish Fingers for quite some time after that. It's a shame I didn't get to take home something to eat that day but nothing tastes sweeter than revenge. Our second revenge story is titled, No Changes Can Be Made Without the Account Holder. Let's get straight into it. This family member's spouse passed, was involved in an accident that left them critically injured. They were in ICU for months and would face permanent disability upon returning home. They didn't want to leave their home, it was close to the best hospital in the region and it was their forever home, so plans began to renovate it for accessibility. In addition to the renovations, a wheelchair van was going to be needed along with other medical equipment for home use. As she worked on all of this, it was clear that large expenditures were going to be needed and it was going to take time to draw money out of long-term savings and retirement accounts. So she called the credit card companies to get their limit increased. Sadly, before the renovations were complete, her spouse passed away after almost six months of hospitalization and therapy. Now attention turned to final arrangements. The couple had always been very frugal and maintained nearly perfect credit. All cards were being paid on time, and despite carrying a balance on some cards from the construction, demolition had already started so renovations had to continue, but at a slower pace money was now coming in from those long-term savings. The problem is one major credit card company refused to work with her. She tried to access the account and was told, sorry, I have to speak the account holder. She explained that her spouse had passed away and she was wanting to pay what was left on the card, she also explained that she was an account holder. Evil Bank stated that she was not on the account, she was a mere card holder and she had no rights to the account. The person on the phone explained that her husband opened the account without her and just gave her the card, she just didn't understand how credit cards worked. This was a lie, the couple had always been joint account holders on everything since they were first married for exactly this reason. They had done extensive estate planning and made sure that all their assets were protected in trust should the worst occur, they knew their kids would be cared for and their partner would be able to access everything. Also, she ran the couple's business for over a decade, navigating a sea of regulations, insurance company billing, and payroll, finances, taxes. Needless to say, she did not enjoy being condescended to. Unfortunately, Evil Bank would not budge. They would not allow any access to the account for any reason, but for some reason they didn't cancel the card after finding out the sole account holder had passed away. This back and forth went on for weeks with multiple calls to the evil bank and trying to escalate the issue to supervisors to address the state of the account. In a final attempt to show evil bank that they were hurting themselves by this. So I'm unable to access any part of the account, even to make a payment. Evil bank, that's right. So the account is going to be closed. Evil bank, no, only the account holder can do that. Even though the account holder is dead. Evil bank, only the account holder, mom. So what does that mean for card holders and being able to charge on the account? Evil bank, only the account holder can deactivate a card or modify the account. So what happens if a card holder uses their card? Evil bank, they can continue to use the card until the account holder tells us otherwise. The deceased account holder. Evil bank, yes. I can't help you with anything else, you need to put the account holder on the phone if you want to change anything or make a payment. No, that's fine. She broke down crying immediately after, but decided that they set the rules, so she would play by them. All the final expenses, medical bills, and as much construction cost as possible was put onto that credit card. She maxed it out and then let it sit until the credit card company started calling for payment. I'm sorry, per your policy, I'm just the card holder and I'm not responsible for any balance. Mom, this balance needs to be paid or it will affect your credit. It better not, I'm not on the account. This is an illegal collections call and I will be reporting it to the FTC and the attorneys general in your home state and mine. I still have his number on speed dial. You can make your case to the court. She was used to getting medical insurance companies to pay claims for the last decade or so, you didn't want to play hardball with her. Remember how all the assets were in trusts. 
On paper, her partner had no assets to place a lien on. All the cash in the joint checking account had been used to pay expenses for the last several months and withdrawals from long-term savings were sent to her account, not the joint account. They had agreed to move all exposed assets shortly after her partner regained consciousness, fearing the worst. Plus, all the income from the business had been brought home in her name for more than a decade so she would actually get some kind of social security payment when she got older. So not only did his estate have no assets to go after, he didn't have an income for the last decade. Evil Bank was left with a maxed out credit card and no assets in the estate they could file against for payment. The handful of other credit cards companies worked with her to raise limits temporarily or remove daily spending caps for large expenditures, and they were all paid without a single missed, late, or partial payment. Evil Bank had to eat a five-figure loss, all because they decided that the wife didn't deserve to be on the account from day one. She had every intention to pay every bill and expense, she has never been one to try to scam or cheat someone. She gave Evil Bank every chance to accept money for the bill, they repeatedly refused to acknowledge her as a spouse or executor, but she sure liked the irony of the only company that refused to acknowledge the death of her spouse ended up paying for the funeral expenses.